Why is there why was there a bear trap right there? Oh, oh, oh Jesus! Oh, oh. Oh. <laughs> Holy <laughs> shit! <laughs> oh. I don't like the idea of this part what at all. What is that? That's a, a, that's a dead person. <laughs> Hold on, ladies and gentlemen. We got us a big one here. And to join us on this journey. We have, of course, brought in the one, the only, Drone Up. What up? <laughs> so, yeah, everybody, we managed to drag someone in on this with us, and uh, it's, uh, to, you think this will be too much for his first time for Internet Historian? Never. 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 Probably not. Never. There you go. So, I guess that settles it. But, Internet historians hard to dislike. Like I liked him from the very first video my buddy showed me yeah. a long time ago. Yeah, again, this dude has been creating content on the internet for like the last ten years, and he has only gotten consistently more, like, better. Like, okay. That's the thing with some creators is they evolve their game and they're not as good. He evolves his game and he somehow is just as good, if not better. He's locked in. Yes. And when he does long-form content like this, I'm talking stuff that's over 30 minutes long, a lot of people would assume, oh, gosh, this is going to be boring. This is going to be, like, awkward. Mm -mm. It's usually mm -mm. a great journey. It's <laughs> usually set, like, I, like, the No Man's Sky one, for me, is a testament to just how good he is at, at telling stories and his editing and everything. I mean, the dude puts a shit ton of effort. I like the Costa videos. Concordia that we did recently. That one as well. Before that we one. moved out of the mansion, I think, is when we did that. Yes. One of the last things we did there. Gosh, the memories. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, uh, the fall of 76, which... Not 76. Yeah, or Fallout 76. I'll just mess with you. Oh, God. <laughs> Please, yeah, but I, I just remembered... And also, I want to thank the Internet Historian fans for going back to our... Because when we played... When we were watching Fallout 7, the Fallout 76, he was talking about like how bad of a launch Fallout 76 was and everything. And when we did a live stream of like the preview of Fallout 76, basically we said, I don't think this is going to be ready, this and that. And the entire Bethesda fan base shit on us. Basically oh, okay. disliked our opinion, told us we were full of shit, called us angry, salty children. <laughs> Even though we were breaking it down like logically and we were just... We were hopeful. We were like, I hope this works, and if it does, I'm going to be very happy. But if it doesn't, I mean, I mean, I, I mean, I, I really don't know what else to say. If I had to tell you guys, it would have been even worse. Yeah, because Nick, so I'm, a, I'm an Elder Scrolls fan, and whenever they announced 76, I was like, you guys just got one. I was like, where's mine? <laughs> I still ain't got my Elder Scrolls Six yet. What the fuck, Bethesda? Yeah. Oh yeah, that announcement that was made what four years ago now, mm. and they Damn. it's just like they announced Elder Scrolls Six, and we haven't heard jack shit since then. Are they tripping? Yeah. Oh, and people were just like, "This means it's gonna be out in at least two years." I'm like, "Where is it? Where are you at now, huh? Where are you at now? Nowhere." Hmm? Yeah, but. People actually went They're back still to working that on their live stupid stream. Starfield uh, the the fucking uh, like uh, internet historian fans went back to that video and just gave that comment section a good thrashing and just like laid into them, just be like, "So how's Fallout seventy six, huh? How's Yo. Fallout seventy <laughs> six? It's like, did you enjoy the game? <laughs> hey, turns out they were right. Turns out you assholes were. Turns out you assholes had everything wrong. And just like, <laughs> uh, and me, I was just sitting there, just like. Yes. Enjoying it all. Yes. <laughs> just watching the fandom just completely devour just the negativity. <laughs> and I'm like, thank you. Good night. I'm be I'll be here all fucking week. <laughs> uh, but Internet Historian is back again <laughs> with Man in a Cave. Man or Man in Cave. And I don't know what this is gonna be about. I'm worried. But man I'm, in cave. But I'm also very intrigued because Let's be honest, anything Internet Historian puts out, I'm going to watch. So anyway, here we go. Man in Cave. Hmm. In the state of Kentucky, there is a cave. Oh, the Mammoth Cave? every now and then oh, demands a sacrifice. January 30th, 1925. Take it a man walks towards the cave with a kerosene lamp in his hand. Uh-huh. 
He hangs up his jacket and ducks into a five-foot opening. The inside of the cave is narrow. He has to drop down on his hands and knees, crawling through a passageway filled with jagged rocks and choking dust. Mm. Then down a chute he had cleared out months earlier. All of the daylight is gone from here, and this lantern is his only source of light. Ignoring the loose limestone rocks perched directly above him, he is now 100 feet in, and here he reaches the turnaround room. Now they call this the turnaround room because this is the juncture where even experienced cavers say, no thanks, and turn around. <laughs> because to continue on means going through this. The, squ- the squeeze. Oh, no. Yeah, I'm going to the squeeze. The I ain't good with nine inches. No! Here's a subway oh. Going yeah. through, he would look exactly... Pass. Supposedly. Supposedly. Oh, Jesus, like man. This. Oh, God. Uh, His arms will need to be completely no. at their side, and he will need to dude, exhale so that he can reduce the size of his torso. Gradually, bit by bit, he disappears into the hole. His nope. clothes are caught on sharp gypsum crystals, no. hooking into him and threatening to hold him Ugh. in place. But using his feet like paddles, he pushes through. <laughs> he reaches a wider opening at no the other emotions. side, then crawls forward towards a ledge. Illuminated here is a ten-foot drop. A rope is already secured around a boulder, which allows him to rappel down. His worn-out leather shoes touch the ground. This is as far as he can go, and it is time for work to begin. What he is working on is another opening. At the moment, it's too small for anyone to fit through, but he will chip away at it until he can shove himself right through the other side. Because on the other side is this. A magnificent and otherworldly cave structure that will be irresistible to tourists. Every day for months he has been removing rocks from this crevice. To him, this is all just routine. So he eases further into the gap. Carefully he contorts his body through. Rocks compress the sides of his torso so close that his arms are pinned to the side of his body. Stretch your legs, stretch your legs. To be back now. Then, about halfway, he stops. Hmm. Oh, snap! It's starting to dim. He will need to go all the way back to the surface to refuel the thing. He sighs. He slowly shuffles back out pushing the lantern with his shoulder. <laughs> then, oh no. This damn head. Ding, crack, duck. Oh! oh he shit. has knocked no! over the lamp, and it has broken. Damn. Now the man didn't panic. He had been caught in the dark before, and he could make his way back by feel alone. So he continues worming out, leveraging his foot against what he thinks is the cave wall. No! But that is not the cave wall. That is in fact a rock protruding from the ceiling. As soon as he puts his weight against the rock, it breaks Oh loose. no. A solid piece weighing 15 kilograms no. lands directly on his ankle. It aches, Shit. but he's okay. It doesn't feel as though his ankle is broken, just badly bruised and caught underneath the rock. So he shuffles to move the rock away. Suddenly, gravel. A lot of gravel. It falls onto his feet, his legs, his torso, and the weight of it all forces the wedged rock deeper into the gap underneath no. his foot. Pinned. He tries to push forward. He God. cannot. He tries to inch backwards. No. He cannot. He is stuck. Fuck. This is Sand Cave. This man is Floyd Collins. Yeah. He is trapped oh. in absolute darkness no 60 feet deep below the earth oh my god all of his limbs held in place ah, this is good spooky season stuff yeah what a nightmarish tale oh. <laughs> nobody gonna find that guy come on bro nate you ain't trying to go bro 
<laughs> See my fat ass! That shit! Hell no! Come on, man. Hell no! Well, there but you go. You don't have to worry about it. You wouldn't be able to get in there to start with. Add time. Speaking of Add time. God, son of a bitch! <laughs> oh! Damn, we got damn. That was five minutes, hey, Nate, man. This is intense. You remember how you asked me kind of what anxiety feels like? No, it's like that. No, I, and I feel and I feel it because again, the the movie The Descent ruined me on like because I used to like want to go into caves and shit, mm-hmm. but then I watched The Descent and it wasn't the monsters. It wasn't anything like that. It was the woman trying to curdle her way through that little itty bitty thing. And again, a lot of people say that the descent is based on, on, on stories like this. Mm-hmm. Oh, Jesus! God, this would be god awful. Oh. So yeah, that's gonna be a thing. If this is what now you know what it feels like if I ever disappear during a party. I'm feeling something like that. What you're feeling right now? <laughs> yeah, that again. I here's the thing. If I if you see me get up and stand up and stuff like that. That's why, like, I'm sorry, but I just won't be able to help myself. Whew. Anyway. Well, trapped in a cave. World of Tanks. World uh, of Tanks is not only the best game I have ever played, uh, it's the <laughs> only game I have ever played. It's like cars, but tanks. Picture this. You're a hot new T-3485M, and you've just joined the battle because some Cromwell B tank bagged your entire family. It's time for revenge. <laughs> you must use strategy. You must use stealth. You must use your wits to defeat your enemies. Use long Someone range did or that short range. Us. It's available on console, but I want you to get it on PC. Imagine a world war, but there are tanks involved this time. Yeah, now you get it. When you've seen as many messed up tanks as I have, you're <laughs> cynical about the world. My guy. I'm gonna be sick. Look at all the different tanks. You can collectomize and customize them all. I was gonna say, baby in tank, I would put a shell straight through that motherfucker. <laughs> Massive kind of battles up. where you can constantly team kill and root. I, I can't take claim for credit for that. Badger said it. It's just like if I see a baby on board sticker on t- on your fucking tank, I'm putting a shell right through it. Wow. <laughs> fuck you. To another people's good time. What the fuck? I'm on your fuck! Yeah! Good on engine, it's historically accurate, especially the Japanese robot tanks. Oh look, the tanks are kissing. Progressive. <laughs> Use the invite code TANKMANIA and get the Excelsior. 250k credits. Other stuff. Go to the link in the description and use the invite code TANKMANIA. Here's what you do. Get Tank Mania. Tanks. Put that on one screen. Then, on a second monitor, you watch the next hour of this video while you play the game. Perfection. Uh, Not happening, but... (laughs) Perfection. We only got the one screen down here that's watchable and another one's for the recording, so... Yeah, sorry about that, IH. Yeah, man. (laughs) Next time, I'm contractually obliged to say thank you for being a friend. Sarge, no! Tanks empty, kid. Go on without me. No, use your repair consumable. It's too late, kid. Take care of my family. <laughs> Take care of my family? Come on. Get it, 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 get it. Add or... I wonder if he finally lost his Nord sponsorship. Oh, still in the dark. Maybe he did. <laughs> Unable to... This dude has been doing the most long absurd long. Nord VPN ads for like a couple Nord of years man. now. You want to be protected from internet... He literally made people. a freaking, like, mascot for NordVPN that <laughs> looks very unfortunate with kind of a pointy white hood and shit. Oh, my <laughs> God. <laughs> oh, I didn't think about that. You there's, didn't think about that? There's it's that, like, and then there's Shadow. I first Shadow. saw it, and I was like, that's really borderline. And then there's like, Shadow Man, who is, like, the black pointed hood, and he's, like, Shadow. He's, like, the uh, for Raid Shadow Legends. Yeah. Raid Shadow Legends. Shadow Man. Pinned underneath his torso. This guy's Shadow Man. Wedged by the rock ceiling above. Beneath him, sharp crystal shards dug into his skin. Ice thawed, traced across the ceiling, and dripped down directly onto his face. Ah, it's it's torture. torture. The water was a consistent 54 degrees. Floyd tried to breathe calmly in the concentrated dark. When he did attempt to shuffle, more gravel and rocks would tumble from above and pile onto his feet. So nothing oh, would work. He clawed at the cave walls till his fingertips were bloody, and he oh. realized that there was only one option left. Call out for help. To wait, who? Wait, 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 wait. Who is Floyd? 
And why did he even go <laughs> to a dangerous cave? Floyd has been exploring the caves of Kentucky since he was merely six years old. And as he grew up, he gained a reputation for being a very daring caver. He would dive into some hole on one side of town and emerge miles away on someone else's property. So, he grew up and he became embroiled in the Kentucky Cave Wars. Now, there's way too much to go into here, but the summary version is there's this huge network of interconnected caves called Mammoth Caves. It's actually the largest cave system in the world. And there's a city right in the middle of it. That's cave crazy. City, it's real name. So of course, like there are dozens of cave entrances on private property Damn. all over the place. Now, farmland in this region has very poor soil, and things do not grow well here. So, cave tourism as a source of income quickly became the prominent thing. Mm -hmm. However, a problem. There are a very large number of caves, but there are only a limited number of tourists. So competition rapidly escalated. Visit my cave. No, no, no. Visit my cave. Big signs were erected saying, Ah, tourists, come to me. Ah, mine is definitely open. Mine is the best. But then competitors would respond by saying, Hey, by the way, we're open, but don't go to that one over there. It's really shitty. In fact, it's dangerous. This kept going further. By the end, they were blocking off the trail to each other's property. Wow. Beating each other in the streets. And yep. hiring people called cappers who would dress up as policemen and tell tourists, no, 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 you can't go in there. That one, no, it's illegal. Despite the fierce competition, Floyd found a cave on his property and he started advertising it to tourists. Of course, very few came. All right, he thought, what if I found something really special and unique? Then surely people would have to come to my cave to see it. So he kept exploring and exploring until he found this hollow. It was filled with big gypsum crystals, and when you were in there, it felt like a completely alien world. But it was barely accessible. This small tunnel is the only way in. <coughs> he would need to dig for months to open it up to tourists, but he knew he could do it. Back to the competition. They knew the value of this cave. They knew the potential. They wanted it for themselves, and they wanted Collins gone. One time, five of them just wandered onto Floyd's property and demanded he hand over the lease. When he refused, they just started beating the shit out of him. Damn, yes, this only Jesus. Stopped when Floyd's brother, Homer, marched out with a shotgun <laughs> and chased them all off. There go, Homer. But Floyd was not deterred. <laughs> he spent 12 hours a day, every day, the black for eye. months, clearing gravel and stone, chipping away at that passage. He would open it up to tourists, make his cave an incredible attraction, and make his dreams come true. Why does that dude's face look so familiar, by the way? Hey! Is anyone there? So there's Floyd in the dark, yelling out for help. He's at the start of a very tiring loop. Sleep, wake, yell. Sleep, wake, yell. Hours passed. His voice gave in. Arms tingled numb. Pain radiating up his ankle. Here he remained in the dark for the next 23 hours. God bless her. Oh, so, so, my granddad was, was a coal miner. Half the mountain fell on top of his ass when a roof bolter... Do you care if I run Grandma Monster while you tell this story real quick since I've heard it before? He's, he's heard me tell it. Oh, okay. My granddad was roof bolter, but the previous roof bolter did a shitty job of securing the roof joist to the slate. Mm. And half the mountain fell on top of his ass. Damn. And basically... Uh, here, let me get the microphone. And basically, he, uh, he was trapped for a little while in the dark, much like this. And he said... The greatest feeling in the world was seeing light again. Seeing light again and hearing someone's voice because he basically just... It, it was not this long, by the way. It was like, I think, two hours, maybe three hours because this was a big incident that happened and people were like right yeah, there no doubt. digging out. But still, and he came out and he was paralyzed from the waist down. That's enough to drive you crazy just being in the dark that long. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. So yeah, that's a half a mountain. Basically, yeah. Uh, 
Well, here's what here's what it was. There was a people on the outside said they could see an indention form into the mountain. What part fell mm. in? What part collapsed? So, so he's catching some of the pressure of it. I would say so. Yeah. Again, that's. Did he die from that? No, no, he got paralyzed from the waist. Oh, okay, paralyzed. No, he 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 was lucky. That's an understatement. Quickly, you might wonder, how come no one's come for him after 23 hours? I would say because he's all well, alone. All right. Sand Cave resides on a 200-acre farm. There are several homes on this property with other families. One of them, of course, is Colin's house, where Floyd's father, Lee, resides. Now, Lee and Floyd constantly get into fights about how to run things. Lee wants his son to concentrate on farming, and Floyd wants to concentrate on cave tourism. Arguments would often be <laughs> And Lee was also a bit of a drunk. It was doubtful that he would even notice if his son Floyd was missing. Also not helping things, Floyd regularly lodged at two other homes on the farm. So when he didn't return to one host, they would presume that he was staying with the other. Oh, no and crap. even worse than that, he had recently spent 30 hours in a cave. So Damn. disappearing for this length of time wasn't seen as abnormal. Regardless, around the 23 hour mark, a few locals started to suspect that, hey, something might be wrong, and they went to check up on him. And here, they spotted his jacket still hung up. Unusual. They went deeper. However, there was only one person small enough to make it as far <laughs> as the turnaround room. This was a 17-year-old Jewel Estes. He refused to go into the squeeze, but it was close enough to call Colin's name. Boy! And Collins yelled back. Yes, I'm here. Estes emerges from the cave. Oh, okay. We know he's trapped, and we know where he is. So, locals started to gather outside. Out of my way. Say a bunch <laughs> of men who would each show up and take turns heading into the cave in an attempt to reach Collins. But once they reached the turnaround room... Nope. Nope. <laughs> nope. They would fail <laughs> Same. Reach him, emerging from the cave, soaked in mud and cursing. Out of my way, they would say as they were heading in the reverse direction. I love the fact that he's using Peaky Blinders characters as like the background extras. <laughs> so a few more hours passed, word would spread around town. Dozens of locals from Cave City started to gather outside. Oh my god. Over in Louisville, Floyd's 22 year old brother, Homer, he gets a phone call. Ah, uh, hello? I see. Ah, my brother. He's trapped in a cave? I'm on my way. Homer jumps on a coach and makes his way to Floyd's cave. I'm about to say, that's a long ass travel. Homer struts up to the sink. Dozens of men are standing around outside. He ignores them all and marches right into the cavern, still wearing his city clothes. He makes his way in, down the chute, through the narrowing passages, down on his hands and knees towards the turnaround room. And when he arrives, he does not hesitate. <gasps> He squeezes oh, into the hole, scrambles his way through to the ledge on the other side. He sees Floyd below and slides down to meet him. Floyd! Sup? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank God you're here. Homer took a moment to shine his light around the area and assess the situation. It was not good. This rock formation is going to prove almost impossible to work around. All right, so let's have a look. Floyd is here. The rock is here, pinning his ankle. He's surrounded by rubble, and there's a pocket of gravel above him, ready to fall. However, <laughs> because me. this opening is so small, there are only two viable ways of reaching Floyd and that gravel. Option one, the most obvious, feet first. But if you do this, you have to kind of squat, and your own torso obstructs access to oh, the rubble. Man. Otherwise, Option two, Shit. come down head first. That will give you better God access, bless. but you're trying to but move how the hundreds fuck of are you pounds gonna get of back up? upside down. Worse yet, there's barely an inch around Collins on either side, so good luck getting your arm down near Floyd's ankle to actually free him from the wedged rock. God, Homer dude. calls back to the less daring rescuers standing behind him. Quickly, some food and drink! 
they send it through. He hand feeds his brother a pint of coffee and a total of nine sausage sandwiches. Feeling better? Much better. Then Homer went to task. He began removing rocks and gravel, tiny scoop at a time, with the help of an old syrup can. Damn, dude. Bro. Warriors can't explain. For the next eight hours he toiled, first with hands, then once enough was cleared, using a crowbar to scoop behind his brother, scraping away sharp protrusions as he went. It was slow progress. Virtually futile. As soon as he removed one rock or a scoop of gravel, another would tumble from above and land in the new absence. And it was exhausting work. By sunrise, Homer's arms and back were knackered. His lungs burned. He was losing hope. Homer emerged hours later, shivering violently, skin bruised from his fingertips. But the cave barely yielded at all. However, something new. By the time Homer reached outside, he was greeted by a sea of approximately 100 men and women standing around, drinking, squabbling, and talking big game about how they too were going to save Floyd. The press was also present to help people gawk from afar. Now, Homer recuperated at a small tent near the cave's mouth. Hmm. Strangers immediately crowded around him to ask innocent, but frankly, frustrating questions and offer unsolicited, obvious advice, as well as wildly impractical solutions. He should try untying his shoes, said one. Ah, no, we should send him down with a contortionist who's got a mallet and a chisel. That's ah, not how that works. We, we should jerk him off. Right, guys? All right, I made that third guy up. But you get the idea. <laughs> they started to argue with each other about their plans. Hey, how about using dynamite? One click formed, insisting that it was a great idea. No! And another saying, Are you crazy? No, no, no. The explosion will kill him, and the weight of the new rocks will surely crush him. They fought for a while until they started arguing about gas torches, which will cook him or asphyxiate yeah, him, what? the gas will poison him. But by far yeah. the most common suggestion, of course, was amputation. Never mind that the foot itself was unreachable, and never mind what the blood loss and shock would do to Floyd's weakened body, and never minding even more that Floyd was strongly reluctant to the idea. Whatever you do, don't cut my foot off. <laughs> All this talk would not have gotten on Homer's nerves, except that not one of them would just brave the damn cave and continue shoveling away the gravel. The formula was always the same. Brave heroes go in with food and supplies, then reach the turnaround room and immediately lose their nerve, then dump the food just outside the <laughs> hole, and then return back outside. And hey, go, oh, excellent. It. No, he says, thanks for the food. Thank you so much. Yum, yum. No one would go through that squeeze. Dozens more men would try. All of them would fail. I'm going to say... I would try and like get the ch like like open up the squeeze a bit more. February That'd be the, yeah, that might be the best oh, way to go. Take though. Homer has been long. the only. It's thick. It looks thick as hell. Floyd, and that would continue to be true until here we are at the Louisville Courier. There's a spirited young newshawk named William Miller. He's talking to his boss, and he's trying to convince him that it's a great idea for him to cover the story of the man trapped in the cave. Listen up, boss. I'm hearing talk of a man in a cave. He's stuck down there, and I want to get down there, too. Get to the nitty-gritty, you hear? This is an opportunity for some good PR, Miller. I'm in. But I want us to sponsor that rescue. Picture this. Man saved from cave by Louisville Courier, the finest newspaper in the state. That'll drum up plenty of business. 24 carat idea, boss. I'll make it happen. I'll get down there too sweet. So off Miller goes to Floyd's cave. Back Nothing. over at the cave, Homer is sitting outside trying to recuperate as Miller wanders up. He glares at the man in his city clothes and answers every question with either a grunt or a one word answer. <laughs> eh. Yeah. Sure. Finally, he gestures to Sand Cave. Listen. You want more information? The hole's right behind me. Why don't you go take a look yourself? Now oh, Miller no. is only 21, but he is a slender and determined man. He takes on the challenge. No. So he removes his suit, drapes himself in coveralls, and grabs a lamp. Miller slowly enters the cave. He finds himself stepping in puddles and having to correct his balance against the ever softening walls. 
these were accumulating problems thanks to the gawkers outside who had lit campfires all around the entrance. That caused snowmelt, and the stable environment of the cave is starting to shift. Oh, but Miller oh, makes it further. Fucking asses. And all that's left is that final squeeze, and he's there. He stops. He takes a moment and decides to call out to Floyd. Floyd! Hearing there is someone on the other side, he feels ashamed not to try. So he closes his eyes no, and moves don't forward. Do it. His slender figure begins inching through. The crystal gypsum cuts mm. into his elbows and tugs at his clothes. He gets snagged. Oh. He's spluttering through the pools of muddy water. He stops, collects himself, and pushes on. He can barely inhale. If he gets stuck in here, he can only hope that someone else can come in from behind and pull him out by the leg. But eventually, he makes it through. Fantastic. He's now standing on the edge of a 10-foot pit, and he clumsily bumbles his way down. He sat right next to Floyd, ready to interview him. What? But Floyd didn't really answer any of his questions. In fact, he was incoherent. At the moment, he is sitting in a pool of water that is 12 degrees, slowly sapping his body temperature. He is dying from exposure. Man. The cold is diminishing Floyd's mental faculties, and he can barely make sentences. So Miller took a few mental notes, and he left. He worked his way back through the squeeze, past the turnaround room, and out into the daylight. He is covered in mud and scratches and numb head to toe. And when Homer saw, his hope reignited. Someone else had made it to Floyd. You and me, together, we can get Floyd out of there. Three. If Miller hadn't gone to that cave, there's a good chance that Floyd's story would have remained an obscure footnote in the back pages. But the interviews and first person accounts gave the audience a glimpse of something real. Fear, hope, desperation, the full range. And so from Los Angeles to New York, Floyd's story was picked up everywhere and described the Kentucky man's plight in sensational detail. It was also the era when radio became a regular feature for regular Americans. Radio allowed something new, hourly updates, letting people get engrossed into the story. So, mostly thanks to Miller, the story of Floyd over the next week would grow and grow seemingly frothing over into every aspect of American life. The press at large would be clamoring over each other for every little extra scrap of detail they could get about Floyd. And everybody wanted to know, will this man make it? Back outside the cave, someone new enters the scene. Lieutenant Robert Burden, a thin but strong 33-year-old Louisville firefighter. Like Miller, he was able to navigate the passages of the cave and brave the squeeze. Scratched up pretty good and drenched in cold, muddy water, he managed to get through. He grabbed the rope and confidently lowered himself to Floyd's position. It was not an optimistic sight. Floyd's condition was deteriorating. Well, we've got a heck of a problem here, but I think I can get you out with a rope. Floyd nods in approval. Go on. We might just pull your bloody leg off. Just pull my leg off then. Get me out of here. Burden returned to the surface and faced <laughs> Yeah, after a point, you start yes. you start to give we up on your leg, I guess. Oh, you gotta be real, yeah. Like, Do I want out of here? It would certainly break his foot and could altogether pull it off. If there are jagged rocks, you'll fill it, the poor man. Amongst the crowd, a doctor stepped forward. A rope pull could stretch his internal organs and cause them to rupture. You'll kill him. But Floyd is dying of exposure down there. Yeah, it doesn't matter. The situation is becoming yeah, right. desperate. Burden put caution Kill him to quick the side. and painfully, the or kill him slow and even more painfully. Now we try brute force. My God! Oh man! What? It's probably what he imagines. Oh yeah. Well, 
Lovecraftian out of nowhere. Yeah. We're here! We're gonna get you out of here! After 79 hours in the cold water, he is delirious, fading in and out of consciousness. Homer gave his brother some coffee and fed him a couple of ham sandwiches. That warms him up and gives him a bit more energy, and he comes back to lucidity. Oh, much better. I'm gonna put the special harness around you. Burden and Miller, they're here too. We got three more boys right up the cave and they're all ready to pull as hard as they can to get you out of here. Floyd was frightened. I'm not gonna lie, it's gonna hurt. <laughs> he gave his brother some whiskey and a strong sedative to calm his nerves, and also to help him withstand the shock in case his foot is destroyed. Yeah. Floyd took the opportunity to appreciate being surrounded by friends and family. Go on, do it. All right, strap him up. Homer tied the harness around Colin's oh chest God. and knotted the rope. Ready? This is gonna suck. Above. Miller is crouched at the top of the pit. Ready! Burden clenches the cord from further up the cave. Three! The rope goes taut. Two! Do it! One! Oh! Instinctively, Floyd gasps. The force of six men pulled against the clutches of the cave. Floyd began to scream. His body was being pulled up from the rubble. The gravel was beginning to shift. Burden clenched his teeth. Oh, hi. Floyd screamed harder as well. Now Floyd was trapped in a supine position, but the direction of the rope caused an upward force that wrenched yeah. him vertically. Right. His torso was being compressed and bent against the ceiling of the trap. It would kill him. Floyd's screaming intensified, and through gasps was begging them to stop. The screams filled the echoing cave, but it did not stop. The agony continued. On and on, oh. with no progress. Enough! Enough! You guys are killing him! Homer pulled in the opposite stop. direction to give his brother some reprieve. Somehow, Homer mustered the strength to altogether wrench the cord from the other men's hands. The rope went slack. Homer, Floyd, and the rope lay limp on the cave floor, panting and exhausted. No progress had been made. Damn. Mm. Shit. The cave would not let this man go. The futility of the situation sank in, and all they could do was leave for now and reassess. Everybody was shaken by the experience. Burden fainted as he crawled towards the exit. Most of the other men had to be carried away. Outside, the crowd had grown to 200. They buzzed and asked useless questions, and Homer walked dejectedly past them. He sat by thinking what he could do. The cause seemed hopeless. Homer? Then... Someone showed up who could turn things around. He looked up to see a childhood friend of both his and Floyd's, Johnny Gerald. Johnny Gerald. Gerald knew more about cave rescues than most. In fact, just that summer prior, he had helped untangle Floyd from a different snag. He was just the man for the job. All right, let me go see him. Well, look who it is. Floyd perked up immediately. Yay. <laughs> <Three> <laughs> <to see> Gerald. <laughs> All right. Let's see what we can do. Gerald jumped down. For the next three hours, Gerald went back to the original plan of prying away rocks. His stamina was good, and progress was surprisingly good as well. For several more hours, he continued, just moving stone after stone. New one would fall in his place, and he'd move that one too. By midnight, he had enough room to shift position and clear some of the gravel that was at each side of Floyd's body. Gerald would spend several more hours scooping, and it worked. For the first time, Floyd's torso God, was now they had this dude here a then long time ago. His All upper right. thigh. For the first time in over 90 hours, Floyd was able to wiggle his arms, his hips, and even that trapped right leg. Oh, I bet that Though felt was nice. Very painful yeah. to do. In that one session, Gerald managed to move a half ton of rock. Oh my God. But there was God. still a lot more to go. And that rock by his foot was still holding him in place. By 2 a.m., Gerald was spent. He, he needed was. rest, and he was ready to head back outside. Floyd, tomorrow you're gonna be a free man. Like that's what's up. Now he <laughs> might think that things will become straightforward. No. They did not. Now that that space had been cleared, 
Burden became convinced that if he could get down that passage again, he could free Floyd with another rope pull. No, Fate no dude. With both feet or just one. But when Burden tried to enter the cave again, he was sternly rebuffed by the locals. They were playing gatekeeper. They had been specifically instructed to not let anyone in, and they were especially opposed to Bird in making another rope pull after word spread about the disaster of the first attempt. He tried to reason with them. Let me try the rope pull again, it'll work this time. They wouldn't let up. Instead, they shouted obscenities and shoved him in the other direction. <laughs> Come here, wow, people actually being smart and good. I know, right? Well, we got that nowadays. Gerald and Homer Rare are incapacitated with exhaustion, and Miller was busy filing some paperwork for the Louisville Courier. Nobody else had the ability or the authority to take action, so Floyd spent all of that morning alone. Hello? Is anyone there? Help! Man. Hey! Anyone out there? Four days? Word spread yeah. about Floyd. Four Miller's reporting had been picked up by the AP Newswire, and they distributed it amongst their hundreds of partnered newspapers. For Miller, it would be the biggest moment of his career. But he didn't stop to pay it mind. He spent the day hatching a rescue plan. Miller descended into the cave and set to work. When he entered, he found that the team before him had strung light bulbs all through the cavern, leading all the way down to Floyd. Very, Very nice. handy. A bulb was also put around Floyd's neck to keep him warm and make sure that he was never again left in the dark. Miller popped down to Floyd. Ah, Floyd! Fancy seeing you here, buddy! Reusing that <laughs> syrup tin, he started offloading gravel into buckets. Those buckets were then passed up and down the cavern. And so it went on for the next two hours. Miller stopped for a break. He took some bread, milk, and whiskey. And sharing it with Floyd, they started to get to talking. Floyd had been in that cave for over 100 hours now. And yeah. seeing everyone working together, Floyd was overcome with a sense of hope and relief. And so he began spilling his heart out to Miller. Here is what he is quoted in the newspaper. I believed I would go to heaven. I can feel that I'm to be taken out alive and with both my feet. I kept thinking what would happen if the rock above me would fall. It caused me to shudder. I kept thinking to drive my mind to something else, but it wasn't much use. I couldn't do much to help those who came to help me, but I knew that a lot of people were willing to do all in their power. It gave me courage. Tuesday morning I thought to myself, four days down here and no nearer freedom than I was on the first day. How will it end? Will I get out? I couldn't think of it. I have faced death before. It doesn't frighten me, but it is so long. Tell them I am not going to give up. Tell them I am going to fight and be patient and never forget them. That's huge. That's big, man. Meanwhile, Floyd's story kept growing. Pedestrians would gather around corner store windows to read the latest bulletins. The press began using giant typefaces, commonly only reserved for declarations of war. Churches in all of the nearby counties were holding services for Floyd. Theatres even interrupted their shows to update the audience. Now, at the time, President Coolidge was in charge, and his Secretary of Commerce was a geologist, Herbert Hoover. Now, Mr. Hoover oh. followed the story very closely, <laughs> and so it was likely that the President did too. Even Congress paused session to ask about the latest news from Sand Cave. By the end, the Floyd Collins incident would explode into the third largest non-political story between World War I wow. and World War II. All of this the excitement Lindbergh, brought an Lindbergh inundation Davey of people to Cave City. Uh, Old uh, population, uh, 690. Yawn. New population, 10,000. Damn. Wow. Hotels ran out of food. Residents turned their homes into makeshift hotels, charging sizable premiums to let people nap in their bathtubs. <laughs> the banks quickly ran out of on-hand cash, and 4,500 automobiles impatiently sat, backed up for two miles from 20 different states to drive onto the Collins Farm and turn their pristine green pastures into swampy parking lots. Deep below all those tourists, 
There's Miller, trying to free Floyd. Alright, a little bit of setup. Floyd, Miller, some remaining rubble, rock. For anyone <laughs> to lift the rock by hand would be impossible Possible, because yeah. Floyd's body obstructs the hole. Miller grabs a crowbar and shoves it through the gap. Now he's going to lever it off Floyd's foot. Cool. The crowbar is now wedged against the rock. Next, he takes a jack. He positions it on top of the crowbar so that it will be forced against the ceiling. However, problem. That jack is too big. It doesn't fit. Uh... Miller yells up the tunnel for a smaller one, but this took some time. And when it arrived, too small. Won't reach the ceiling. But instead of sending for another one, Miller takes two blocks of wood and bolsters them underneath the crowbar. Right, so the crowbar now sits higher, it fulcrums against the blocks, and the jack is sitting on top. All Miller has to do is expand the jack, which he will do using this spanner, holding it at the very tips of his fingers. Sounds easy. It's no, not. No, it's not. But that's the plan. Let's get him out of there. He turned the wrench. The jack expanded and the crowbar took mm. strain. Mm. The whole thing slid apart with a Ah, oh, I knew it. Floyd well, wasn't hurt, dangerous but Miller it. was contorting and exerting his whole body from back to fingertip. They tried again. Same result. Miller tried a new angle. Maybe this time. The jack pressed. The tension increased. And this time, the rock moved. It fucking moved. With each turn, the stone shifted a little more. Miller's hands shook with adrenaline, his face and body dripping with sweat. Pang. One of the blocks slipped, and the wooden tower went sideways. The rock painfully slammed back down on Colin's foot. Ah. Get it next time, Miller. Try again. Miller did. Again. And again. Adding blocks, taking them away, new crowbar position, changed the jack position, every angle, all while Floyd was there, cheering him on. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> oh. No, no wow. more hours, no hours, man. No progress. Miller was exhausted. He couldn't do this on his own, but he was the only one slim enough to get in through the gap. The group decided to concede for now and return to the surface. They would take just a small break, but it looked to everyone like there was a clear way to get this man out. So Miller and Burden crawl back through the mud and the winds of the cave. As they made their way through, the cave was visibly sagging. The ceiling seemed lower. Parts oh, were shit. harder to navigate than before, especially now with their bruised and purple hands. But they made it outside to the fresh early morning air. And here is where they're greeted with a new sight. Dozens of soldiers. The National Guard had arrived. In addition to the National Guard, a new figure was joining the story. Henry Carmichael. Now, Carmichael was the general superintendent oh, the of the Kentucky Ow. Rock Ow. Asphalt Company. Ow. He had been on site since Tuesday, and he was appalled at how primitive the oh, rescue attempt. Where'd he at, you little... There he goes. Oh, he's going back. He, he's back that way. Yeah. We deal with that every winter. Every winter okay. here. Yeah, you know, at least one or two. I wonder how they get in. That door over there, it's... Got a little bit of a space in it for them uh, to wriggle their way through. Yeah, we need yeah, to see if we can block that off somehow. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Back Tents to this guy. Been. Shortly after Miller and co. had exited, Carmichael sent two men into Sand Cave to assess the structure's stability. They soon came back with a report. It was not good. Mm. Near the final squeeze, large cracks had formed. The ceiling was beginning to droop. All right, so the following is a recounting of events from one of Carmichael's men, Casey Jones. <clears throat> Casey and another worker spent about an hour in the cave, surveying its condition, looking at the boards, the ceiling, the stability of the walls. He continued deeper towards Floyd. He was fighting against his nerves. The shifting of the rock pinged his every instinct to flee. But he heard Collins moaning ahead, so he pushed <sighs> himself on. He managed to make it through the squeeze and he arrived at the ten-foot pit. Seeing Floyd trapped, he tried to ignore the pebbles that were tumbling behind him. Please, come down. Uh, I can't right now, Floyd, but I will when I get back. 
Behind Casey, his partner is begging to leave. Below Casey, Collins is pleading for help. Please, I'm so thirsty. Okay. Damn! Casey slid headfirst into the pit and hastily ladled Floyd some coffee. But Floyd rejected it. No, no. Rumbling intensified from above. And in that moment, Casey realized that this was not a plea for sustenance. Floyd knew that a cave-in was inevitable. Scared and approaching his fifth day trapped, he was completely at his wit's end. He knew oh, he was about no. to be trapped in that cave, and he didn't want to be trapped alone. For God's sake, Casey, come on, you'll get us killed. Stay with me, please, don't leave. Casey looked into Colin's eyes, set the coffee down, and pulled himself out of the pit. He wiggled underneath the sagging ceiling and crawled oh, towards the turnaround room as fast as his limbs could scramble against the cave walls. He looked back to see the passage closing like a maw. Reflections from the bowl shining around Floyd's neck were no longer visible. Instead, just sobs could be heard, muffled from behind the rocks. Oh, man. Miller and Burton awoke in the late morning, confident that today would be the day that they saved Floyd. They had some new equipment too. Some wire to wrap around the wooden blocks to prevent them from slipping. And they changed their mind about that acetylene torch. They'll use it to burn away two rocks that had previously blocked their way. But when Miller got to the turnaround room, all of that optimism left him. The entrance to the squeeze was now just a pile of debris. Miller froze, staring at it for a long while. Then he sighed and did the only thing he could think. Attempt to move some of the stones. Oh, man. But each adjustment led to more rocks just tumbling down and landing in that space. He persisted until... Crash. <gasps> a large chunk of clay landed onto his feet. Recognizing the danger, Miller returned to the surface. Yeah, Fifteen oh, minutes later, he emerged from the cave with a bloodied up nose and bruises down his back and shoulders. Burden caught sight and races over to him. Miller just says, for God's sake, just don't let Homer or anyone else back in there. Now, he didn't actually need to worry about Homer going back in there because he was sidelined with illness. But he did, however, need to worry about Gerald because he was furious. Gerald had warned everyone that putting dozens of people in Sand Cave would cause a collapse. It certainly did. The rest of that day would be wasted, as men threw blame around and screamed at each other about how to handle the cave-in. Oh, and Floyd man. spent the rest of that day alone. With no way! The surveyors continued checking the cave throughout the day. By the evening, Carmichael had ordered everyone to an assembly. Gerald took the floor. He was going to try one last daring rescue. He boldly announced his plan and an ultimatum. Listen up. There's death down there. The walls and ceilings are crumbling. Unless you're determined to take the biggest chance you ever took in your life, tell me now and stay outside. Next, they told all the Gorkas to get the fuck out of the cave and clear off. And over the next eight hours, Gerald would enter and leave Sand Cave at least five times, chipping away at that pile of debris. In the woods, men sawed trees and chopped logs to shore up the cave walls. Underground, the crew reinforced cracks and wobbling boulders with fresh strips of wood. Gerald assessed that about four barrels of rocks would need to be moved, and piece by piece, they made that happen. Steadily. They managed to move enough rock to allow Gerald to get within earshot of Floyd. Hey. Hello. I need food. Bad news. We can't reach you. But hold on. We're coming. Stone by stone they continued. After a few hours, the light of the bulb around Floyd's neck was peeking through. A couple more hours. Enough room for Gerald to squeeze through. Okay. That's enough. Floyd, I'm going for now, but when I get back, I'm going to get you out of there. Exhausted but still determined, Gerald crawled back up the cave and marched to the men huddling outside. Gather the equipment, and in an hour's time, it's going to be me and Floyd coming out of that cave. Fingers crossed. 
Uh, Gerald entered now. Sand Cave for his oh, no, final right. time. <laughs> Four hours later. The walls had been reinforced. But mud and water was accumulating everywhere. He waded through it and pressed on past the danger of the sagging ceiling. With determination on his face and a grease gun clutched in his right hand, he scrambled towards Floyd. But before the final squeeze, he stopped. It was all gone. The cave ceiling had crumbled once again. No! Gerald stared motionlessly at the pile. Then he began to yell. Floyd! A rock disconnected from the ceiling and tumbled onto Gerald's head. Oh. Luckily, just a small one. Okay. He rubbed his scalp and called out again. Floyd! This time, a moan. It rumbled from the other side. Fearing that his friend was slipping out of consciousness, Gerald willed himself against the cave, launching the debris behind him with force. He ignored the pain from being struck on the head and clawed at the stone pile. He carried on this way for several minutes, until a sharp, heavy rock dropped from the ceiling and landed squarely on his back. Oh, shit. No more than 15 minutes later, Gerald returned to the surface. Defeated. Only after the cave did they start to think about all of the things that they could have done. Wait, why didn't we rig a portable telephone line? That would have been incredibly simple here in 1925. Yeah, why have we been running in and out to deliver updates? Why didn't we give him an AM radio? He could have had something to listen to and receive messages of support from the public. Wait, why don't we rig up a tarpaulin so we could lift his torso up so he wouldn't be slowly dying of exposure? Oh god, why didn't we run a feeding tube? That's also a technology we have in 1925. Yeah. All too late. Now what? The one route to get to Floyd is closed forever. That meant two options. Number one, capitulation. Surrender him to the cave. Or number two, dig down from directly above Floyd. Now, the prospect of digging from above seemed almost fanciful. At least, it did in the beginning. But luckily, they had some help. Owing to Miller's reporting, Floyd had become practically the most famous person in the country. The rescue had become a high priority for the governor of Kentucky. Lieutenant General Denhart enters the scene. He's been updated on the situation, and following shortly behind him is a small army of miners and engineers. He declared to the despondent crowd, Gentlemen, I am here on behalf of the governor. The purse strings of Kentucky are open. Take this blank check and bring that man out alive. Whoa. Floyd in that cold, wet confine could not have imagined the scale of the operation that was going on 55 feet above him. Say, man. Authorities assumed many, control many of Collins' rescue. Denhart gave him the <laughs> lead to dig, and Carmichael raced to get to work. He enlisted his employees, his fleet of expensive high-tech machinery. Professional groups were brought in from all across the state. Local townspeople were mostly excluded, and for the first time since Collins had been trapped, work was now about to go ahead in a systematic manner. Everyone knew the plan, everyone had something to do, and everyone was working fast. But just as hopes were rising, they were once again dashed against the rocks. They had all of this state-of-the-art machinery shipped in and assembled by the engineers and rearing to go, and it was all worthless. See, the problem is, the cave drew air into it. These diesel-powered engines no. pumped out enormous volumes Man. of choking exhaust. Oh, no. Within a day's operation, the cave would be filled with carbon monoxide and Floyd would be dead from yeah. asphyxiation. Just as quickly as solutions would arise, the cave would parry them away. It refused to let this man go. So engineers and miners had wasted hours assembling everything, only to realize that they had to pack it all up and cart it away. Damn. Because the digging of a 55-foot shaft would be done with Bye. picks 
and shovels. Yeah. Carmichael didn't know much about caves, but he knew a lot about quarrying. And he estimated that his team of 75 volunteers could dig and dredge at a rate of two feet per hour. If they worked around the clock, they would be digging directly into the spot where Floyd lays within 30 hours. Now, was it possible that Floyd could survive for another 30 I don't hours? Oh, man. Absolutely. Let's go. The first ton was moved, and at first, it was easy work just dirt and clay. Carmichael understood well that this was a race against time, so he watched the men closely, and if they seemed to be slowing down, even a little, they would be yanked out and immediately a new worker <laughs> subbed in. Nonetheless, nice. the pace slowed. By Much better feet, than forcing dudes to overwork themselves greatly, in a situation which like meant that. that only two right. men could work at a time. At 15 feet, they hit boulders. Pickaxes went in, and a system of pulleys and buckets had to be used to cart the rock out. Tracks were even laid to ferry the refuse to a dump site. Time passed. Hours passed. Night went to day. The day was hot. This was yet another problem, because it's early February, there's tons of ice still in the ground, and its exposure to the fresh midday sun meant that the walls of the shaft were softening and the ground becoming sodden. The pace of digging slowed. It was now only half a foot per hour. Most anyone could do was watch helplessly on the sidelines and pray. Interestingly though, there were a lot of people on the sidelines. Floyd wouldn't have believed that the space above him had turned into a literal carnival in his honour. Vendors showed up to sell hamburgers, hot dogs and souvenirs. Families sprawled out over blankets to listen to hymns from local church groups. The local mountebanks sold moonshine and miracle cures. There was even a bloody juggler. And old man Lee was Glad y'all are having fun up there while he's down there fucking suffering. Right? Like, and soliciting I get out and be pissed. But where were Homer and Burden and Miller during all of this? Okay, let's back up a bit. People did not properly understand exactly how Floyd was trapped. And the news didn't help much either. So the obvious question started to arise. Why hasn't he been rescued yet? Just clear some gravel or pull a rope. How is this so hard? Motive was attributed. I heard they didn't even want to have him rescued at all. I heard that they're doing all of this for publicity. And Lee's activity of soliciting donations, remember from before, further inflamed rumours. I bet Floyd isn't even trapped in there. These were all real rumours, and they got worse. You know what? I've heard he comes out at night, and then he just goes back in in the morning. Wow. Other rumours included. I heard that after Floyd went into the cave, someone murdered him. Others said, I think they're withholding food and water from him so he dies. This whole thing is a fraud. As time went on, it was harder and harder to ignore the hoax claims. Then, people started to form righteous mobs, claiming the whole thing was a fraud, and they started to get nasty. In fact, two people even went to the telegraph office and pretended to be Floyd sending telegrams to his mother. Here's what it said. Quote, Please contradict statements that I am buried alive in Sand Cave. Stop. Tell mother I am all right. Stop. Am coming home. Stop. Floyd Collins. Naturally, the AP published these telegrams unquestioningly, and now word is out to the press that he isn't actually in the cave after all. That made the authorities look foolish, and it could not go on. So, a hasty court-martial was arranged, and Homer, Miller, and Gerald were summoned. They hold one session on Monday and another on Tuesday. Lee and everyone else is cleared of charges. A retraction is written and things carry on. Generators rumbled. Pumps churned out water. Men continued working in ships and carrying away the earth. Here they are with strips of lumber to shore up the walls. They were only 25 feet down. The pace had slowed to four inches per hour. In their desperation, they resorted to dynamite, but this did little to the boulders. Despite all these bleak circumstances, 
people's spirits were high because everyone was keen for their turn to dig and because they had one more thing to latch onto. He is probably still alive. Now, how do they know that? Okay, so remember that light bulb around Floyd's neck? Well, it's powered by a simple copper wire. Bare copper wire is subject to very minute fluctuations in resistance. So, an engineer rigs up a radio amplifier to this wire to read the current and see those small fluctuations. There they were. His heart rate. 20 per minute. Oh, the rate the of steady runs. breathing. As his chest expands and contracts, they can read it from oh, this device. Okay, so okay. And so they kept going. 240, 2, 300. And going. 300 hours? And going. 30 hours was the original estimate. Now 144 hours had come and gone and they were only at 44 feet. Then rain fell. Shit. Rain that mixed with dirt to make mud. Much of which then froze to make ice. Ice which expanded and damaged the integrity of the shaft walls. Slowing down with every hour, they continued. He ain't dead. Many more hours passed and they were getting close. But it was now 15 days since Floyd was first stuck in that cave, and people had mostly lost hope. That excitement in the newspapers was tempering down. Visitors began clearing out from Cave City. Many still held on to hope, but their final lifeline, that light bulb, had burnt out. And it wasn't possible to do any more readings on the radio amplifier without it. No one knew if Floyd was still alive. Damn, bro. Never in my life. Another 51 hours would pass before finally they reached the 60 foot depth. I'm in. Chisel. A chisel was handed down. At 1.30 p.m. on Monday, February 16th, Sand Cave would open once again. For 17 days, Floyd had been trapped underground. Stuck in the same what position. What's he look like? Bro? Four days without heat or light. Twelve without food or water. But maybe the dripping of the cave water had provided him with some sustenance? There are stories of people surviving harsher extremes. Rescuers frantically tugged at rocks to widen the hole. Everybody stood by, absolutely silent, peering into that hole. Id flashed his light into the gap, then eased himself in. Brenner aimed his light around the room, and then finally at Floyd. The first thing he saw was a golden shimmer. It was not the light bulb. It was the reflection of Floyd's tooth. His mouth hung open. He was dead. Damn. Brenner was helped out of the cave and he delivered the news. Dead. A coroner would later state that Floyd succumbed to exposure and that they had missed him by just three days, about the same time that the light bulb had gone out. Man. But what would they do now with the body? The shaft walls were ready to fall inwards, and risking lives to remove a corpse was seen as just irresponsible. So the following morning, officials made a decision. Floyd would be entombed where he lay. The cave would keep its victim. Now this did not sit well with the family, but what could they do? The next day, they planned the funeral. The town emptied of people and the shaft with Floyd at the bottom was refilled with soil. But that's not quite the end of the story. But if you hung on for this long, keep holding on, because things are going to continue to get interesting. But first, let me do a wrap up of where everyone is and all that stuff. Context, context. The Collins family already had financial hardship. Locals saw old man Lee scouring the rescue site for glass bottles. But the owner of the land, B. Doyle, and supposed friend of Floyd, was wholly unsympathetic. He erected a sign on the highway which said, 
200 yards away, the body of Floyd Collins is imprisoned in Sand Cave. Then he began charging tourists 50 cents apiece for the opportunity to gander into the hole. It's 100 years later, bees dead. Let's call it even. Also, remember those claims of Kentucky being an open purse? Well, the state reneged on the deal. They refused to pay many of the rescuers, and most of them went home without any compensation. What the some fuck? of them did make some money out of the situation, though. They lucked into vaudeville gigs and roamed the country, giving their first-person account. Miller, however, received an astonishing offer, a $50,000 contract from the Chautauqua Lecture Circuit, equivalent to the better part of a million dollars in today's money. He declined. He continued to work at the Louisville Courier Journal. The following year, his coverage of Floyd's story earned him the Pulitzer Prize. Damn. Now the brother, Homer, he needed money and he agreed to do that vaudeville circuit. He stood on stage and regaled the audience about tales of his brother, their childhood, and the tragedy. But Homer made it known why he was up here on stage trying to get money. He had a mission. I kept thinking of Floyd lying in the muck where he had suffered beyond our power to imagine. Yeah, I man. would never have peace of mind if he remained there. He wanted the money to dig Floyd up and get him out of that cave. A couple of months later, he had it. All right, so back to Floyd. April 17th, 1925. Seven miners showed up to the scene. They began to dig. Within a week, they had arrived at Floyd. And this time, they approached from the other side of the rock formation. That way, they could remove the rock pinning Floyd's leg. They lifted him up from his tomb and laid him down on the fresh air above. April 26th, 1925. Floyd was set to rest in the family cemetery. A stalagmite had been set as a headstone to mark out his plot. Damn. And there he lay for... No, that's not actually where it ends. Okay, this is where it gets weird. Two years later, this 1927. Right. Times have been tough for the Collins. So Floyd's dad sold Sand Cave to a dentist named Dr. Harry B. Thomas for $10,000. Now Homer begged him not to because at the time the government was starting to buy up tons of land in the area and turn it into national parks. They had to pay at a very competitive rate. But Lee was becoming a bit old and senile by this point. And frankly, it's doubtful that he God cared dang it, Lee. about Homer or Floyd or anyone else for that matter. It's 100 years later, he's dead now, let's call it even. So, the point is, in this land sale with Thomas, Lee agreed to a very odd clause. And that clause said, everything on that property belongs to Thomas. And should he wish, for example, to exhume a dead body and re-embalm it and put it on display in something really tacky like a, I don't know, a glass coffin inside a cave, maybe, then that would be his prerogative. Lee signed yes. And Thomas did exactly that. Doyle Jesus made Floyd's Christ. corpse a tourist attraction. Wow, That's right. Man. Two bits of gander. Come and wonder at the incredible dead man who died in a cave. But to add insult to injury, it worked. Visitors returned to Sand Cave to gawk morbidly at Floyd. Within a few months, Thomas had turned Lee's failing farm into a successful business. Now, the rest of Collins' family is horrified. They try a number of times to get Floyd returned to them, including through the legal system. But somehow, incredibly, the judge ruled in Thomas's favor. And so... I was going to say, contracts are hard to break, man. Sometimes, I mean, it's... Again, that's bullshit if you ask me but again the fact that the father signed everything on the property over i mean it is what it thing, is man there's no like it's a body it's not living anymore people like man. again I, that's just fucked up it's just far beyond yeah it's just like with the whole story and context it's just far beyond that man like there he lay for the next two years Jesus. The cave was not done with Floyd. Oh my god, are you serious? Cave, stop! This cave has become a monster to Someone me. Someone hatched a plan. 
Two years later, it's midnight, outside Sam Cave. Footsteps can be heard rustling through the brush. Now, we don't know who these two men are, but we know why they are here. I bet I know who one of them is. I know, right? It's Floyd, and I wouldn't say the father. I'd say it's Floyd in the newspaper. Right, I was was going to say, like, if I was willing to bet a little bit of money, I would say it's brother and the reporter. Yeah. 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 And clamor over They're the two best dudes in this situation besides. Or it could be be his friend, too. Could just be a homie. His friend, his 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 brother and the reporter were the three good guys in this scenario. Hopefully his friend is okay, because, you know, taking that rock to the back. Or maybe the, maybe the firefighter as well like he yeah. was decent except for his screw up with the hose thing you know, <laughs> or the you know yeah again he was decent oh, at first the but there is his shriveled body they throw him in a gunny sack and they race off into the night for 800 yards they carry dear floyd like a couple of sweaty santas about to deliver a really terrible christmas present <laughs> panting out of breath knowing that they're going to get caught any minute they reach the kentucky green river hillside there's no time with a one two three they launch his body Yeet. towards the river and floyd goes sailing floyd man he couldn't have peace and death up, bro up into the starlet beyond um, and landing in a bush. Oh gosh! Shit. <laughs> Floyd went out like nobody else wants to go. Just say, man. This is like weekend at Bernie's Redneck Edition, yeah, dude. I mean, what the fuck? Yeah, I like all of a sudden, it's just like, look, Floyd's flying. <laughs> I'm gonna get to heaven myself and talk to God. Like I was gonna say, Floyd <laughs> touched some sort of specific <laughs> cursed piece of gravel in that cave. That's what and that piece the of cursed did, was that crushed his Yeah, leg. the curse did not leave him from the time he got stuck <laughs> until like he was still a dead body. Like Fair. he never left his corpse. Yeah, yeah. and again, like, like you're saying, if you're in, if I'm in heaven, I'm looking down at this. I'm just be like. What the hell are they doing to my body? <laughs> like, no, don't throw, don't throw don't me, throw no. Me out there. And then all of a sudden, you're just up there, like God. Are you really letting this happen? Yeah, right like, now? God, <laughs> God, God. And God's just like, God's just like, free will, man. <laughs> They're like, doing hey, this man. on their own free will. <laughs> like, hey man, y'all are messed up. Yeah, that's what God said. Yeah, y'all are fucked up. It's like y'all, <laughs> y'all the ones. Yeah. Fuck, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the two men flee from the scene. Like, be wild, now, the next morning, Thomas notices that the body of Floyd is somewhat missing, and he contacts the authorities. The police come, they dust the casket for fingerprints, and bloodhounds are given Floyd's scent and let loose into the hillside. A few hours later, they manage to find him. He tangled up mess <laughs> near the river, but this time with a leg missing, that same one that was trapped under the rock. So, despite his protests, it had been amputated. Damn wow. it. Neither the leg nor the culprits were ever found. And while it would be nice to think that this was some well-intentioned duo that did this out of the kindness of their hearts to free Floyd, it's much more likely that it was an act of vandalism because Floyd was simply too much of a hot tourist attraction. The following day, Damn. Floyd yeah. was passed back. So I thought for a cave, second. Oh. Back into his box. And it was covered by a metal lid surrounded by a metal chain and locked with a padlock he was now more trapped than he had ever been wow yeah this is foul this bro this had spun fate once again to make sure that its victim would never leave and so time passed floyd's body would continue to decay uh, the duh. rot from his body would eventually rot the casket too yeah and every decade or so it would need to be replaced. A few years later, he was no longer on display. But even then, he remained in that box for many more years. In 1961, Floyd's Cave was purchased by Mammoth Cave National Park, and it was closed to the public. There would be no more visitors. The entrance itself to Floyd's Cave was closed with a steel gate and bolted, then welded shut. But the Collins family never gave up objecting to Collins' body being left in the cave. And <laughs> I love the fact that in the courtroom, it's just like, being left yeah, it's him and his son, two sons. <laughs> oh, <snap. laughs> I also like the fact that they're in color now, too. Since yeah, uh, the yeah that's the other thing, oh, now they're true. in Technicolor. Yeah. <laughs> Damn it, Homer. And here is where the story ends. <laughs> 
In 1989, at the Collins' request, the, the National Park born. Service ventured into Floyd's cave. Continuing on a more than 60-year tradition, a team of people worked over the course of several days to remove him from the cave. They took him out, left the cave, locked it behind them, and laid Floyd to rest at the Mammoth Cave Baptist Church Cemetery. Thank God. I know, right? After 64 yeah, years yeah. in Sand Cave, he is now finally at peace. Finally. The end. Floyd, they put you through it, homie. Thank you to Wendigoon as Floyd. If you don't let me out, I'm going to hire a gang of hitmen to come to your house and kill your family. Samito as Homer. Thought that was Samito. Yeah. Oh. I'm hungry. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> and eat some BTS, bro. Ordinary things as Miller. I mean, ah! he's that stick, but would ultimately dock out the back exit. Rusty Cage as Gerald. Oh, well, hello there. Haven't seen you all in a while. Welcome to my new home. And many kudos <laughs> as Burden. Hey! Hey, buddy! This is how it works now. Okay, so story mode. Yeah, that's his. That's his uh, third channel. That, I didn't know I had a third one. Yeah, he talked about it in another video. He's just like, I, I also have a third channel out there. I completely but missed I'm that. Not telling you where it is. Oh right, Good right, luck finding yeah. it. And okay. they eventually found it, and now the public knows it's story mode. And he's just like, all right, all right, I've been found out. Mm -hmm. Are we going to react to anything off of that? or could We I, can. We can. I, I was going to say, I, I would totally go for like having a third channel I could just react, or not react to, but like you know, watch, watch watch in my own time. Oh, yeah, yeah, by that. all means. Well, again, I was going to say, by all means, you can watch it. And if it's something you've watched, then you know, I'll put it on the back burner for someone else. All right. This dude, man, he just oh. took me through and so many forget, emotions. World of tanks, world of tanks. None world of, of tanks. Tank mania. World tank mania, of mate. tanks. That, that was the most intense. Like, I mean, that was intense for a first introduction to Internet Historian. Like, he's got... His other <laughs> stories are riveting, but nothing was that intense nothing up to that this point. Nothing that intense so. or, like... like that like just gloomy gloomy yeah, yeah gloomy usually they're like very like uplifting and funny well and, sometimes no, at okay. least he puts a lot of comic relief into darker That's situations true. yes so. but this is probably one of the more darker ones that he's done well this one like gave you hope kept giving Took it you away hope. yeah this gave is, you hope again and then, and then at the last ending. second just dashed it all like, away yeah, yet he again died. he died at the end he's dead 33 pounds, bro. That's how it took. Well, again, I mean, you know, that's the thing. I mean, again, I have nothing but respect for people who are coal miners and, you know, and are willing to put themselves in situations like that. But here's the thing. I suffer from something called the bigness. <laughs> and I don't think I would last very long in a constricting coal mine. Now... I've been to the Mammoth Cave system. I've walked into some of the bigger ones, some of the ones that are open to the public. And it is wondrous to look into. You know, because again, natural cave formations and just witnessing just how they came to be and the formations that are on the wall and all that and the stalagmites and stalagmites. I bet what he saw was beautiful, man. Oh, yeah. And but, I bet it has, I don't know, there's got to be some type of, I want to say there's some type of mystical presence or spiritual presence that that deep down there, you're well, seeing all that? Well, again, there was a, a friend of mine, uh, his uh, dad was a was a spelunker, like cave, cave diver. Word. And there was this uh, patch of caves in uh, Tennessee that he was looking into. And all of a sudden, he came out the cave and... And he was greeted by four men dressed in denim. All of them had shotguns. And they said, you shouldn't go back in there. I think it'd be very detrimental to your health. And they basically chased him off because, again, even though it was on uh, you know, state land and he was legally able to do that, these people didn't want them in there and he didn't want to know what they had going on in there. Oh, I believe that. Yeah, yeah. just like all of them. And again... He like he was worried that he would find like you know find something he shouldn't and then they would put and they would you know bury him. Dead down him. There. <laughs> they would basically like leave him down there. Yeah. Because again, 
you know, it's very, fr like, the human body is as resilient as we are. We have our Achilles heels. Mm -hmm. We are, we are very fragile creatures whenever it comes to, like, being against something much, like, the Earth, for instance. Oh, yeah. The planet Earth is an unforgiving bitch. Hitting concrete is the worst. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, falling, anything like that. Well, falling, you know, being trapped, you know, being pulled under in a current of water, uh, being trapped on Just a mountainside with no, way, with no way of getting down. Yeah. You know, being lost in the mist and getting lost in this. Because there was this uh, bam, uh, the bamboo thicket that we mm. saw on, uh, on uh, Mr. Ballin's channel, uh, getting lost up there and getting, like, trapped on these plateaus that... You know, a very beautiful, thick bamboo thicket, but just impossible to traverse if you do not know where you're going. And, again, that you see, there's things in nature that I'm willing to test myself to a certain degree. Like, I'm willing to go out into the wilderness and, uh, you know, like live off the land, go fishing, you know, forage for stuff. No doubt. You know, you know, make a campfire. Test your man. Yeah, test test how how well I could do on my own. I, just, I ain't doing that. Yeah, I don't know. No, fuck emotion. all that, bro. I have no. a very specific addiction to not being stuck in caves. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah right. As you saw me, I mean I got I got like, again my claustrophobia kicked in and I was like, eh, no, no. Bruh. I got up and moved, had to move. I had to, you know, walk around the room. I'm thinking about the water just sitting on them. Yeah. And I'm just like, that sounds so bad because I hate a cold shower. Right. You know what I'm saying? Now so imagine a cold, cold shower well. covered in stones. A cold bath, 12 degrees, stones. I'm getting stabbed up in my arms and my legs booty. Legs trapped. Legs trapped. Yeah. Probably cut up, bleeding out well, somewhere. He had to be and, bleeding and out. And again, um, the whole thing is, like, as soon as the state came in, as soon as, like, again, this this whole thing, I would say a big thing that could have helped would be if instead of them, uh, well, again, you know, that diesel engine thing was, you know, unable to do, you know, do the digging, if they would have had that, if they would have had the exhaust line going away from the mountain, mm -hmm. then I think maybe they could have done something. But again... You know. I wonder if they couldn't have solved it with physics, if they had a good enough engineer there to tell them how to try it. Maybe. Um, so my thought was when they said that they couldn't pull him up with the rope with the harness because his chest it was a new, hit it was against a new the top an angle. right it was impossible right because his body was bracing my immediately against thought yeah. my immediate like thought hitting. from physics is all right or rig the harness to him run the rope horizontally to the to the wall behind yes the wall they, of had the shaft, those, they had those and anchor spikes. anchor a pulley there yeah a wheel so that the rope force from his harness to the pull from the harness comes horizontally to pull him that way first towards yes. the outside wall. Yeah. So basically you have a, a pulley have... here and then like you can actually pull from the top and you probably have a pulley on the top to like not have, you know, freaking, uh, it, it lessens the friction of the rope well, against again, the top. Pulley systems but basically are... like if you set it up, you can, you can redirect that force from pulling this way to pulling this way. Yeah. Well, no. And again, if you have a pulley, cause how they had him in the cave, you know, the little entrapment here, this area here was preventing him from going up. Yeah. Now, if you plant a cave spike here and you attach a pulley system to it like you're saying, mm. and you have that pulling him out like that instead of pulling up like this, mm. then that could have potentially... That, like you, What you're saying is 100% So If they could have got viable. him close enough to that other wall that his foot at least got out... But it's the thing it, with the stone, And they could right? start pulling him up, like, and, you know, at least, like, he could pull up this way, and, like, this would be against the stone instead of his chest. Yeah. Yes. Like, oh, like, more his abdomen? Yeah. So, like, they needed to get him pulled along his back they first. They need to get him to, yeah, like, 90 up. degrees. Like, they need to get yeah, him sitting they, up. Once they but get him I, 90 degrees, they can get him out of the I cave. I think if everybody else hadn't have interfered, his buddy could have saved him. His buddy seemed to be an experienced spelunker, and I think he could have got him well, out. Again, I think everybody I mean, else fucked it everyone over. Everyone yeah. coming around, setting up K or setting up uh Yeah, all those people setting cave, up fires and shit. Up, like, just fucking up the entire infrastructure of the cave. Yeah. Again, like... The, that's the thing about nature. You, you, and here's the other thing too. You think that you're helping to a certain degree 
But if you are not aware of the situation, you are doing more harm than good. Facts. And people, and again, this is why in certain rescue situations, that's why you leave it to the professionals. Well, that's why I didn't even, I wasn't even hating on the people that was turned around. Because you don't got a plan. You no. Know, you don't need to be down there. No. Right. And that's why I was afraid of, you like, get stuck to you're just in the way of getting like him to the say writer, okay. where the writer was an inexperienced spelunker and had never been in a cave before, I was afraid he was going to get stuck. Yeah, no yeah, doubt. Same. That's no what doubt. I was afraid of. I was just like, oh, God, this gonna he's going to get stuck and they're both going to be fucked. But at the same time, at that point, they were getting to a premium of, like, people who were actually brave enough to go to where he was at. So that was kind of a... Well, they had a boon at that point. They had at least he actually three. was willing they to try. Homer, his brother, the newspaper worker, and the uh, firefighter. Mm. Those three right there, I think. And then, of course, the spelunker dude came on a little bit after that. Mm. And again, I think time is of the essence whenever it comes to being trapped like that. And you need, and you know, you need. Bro, anything past a anything past three days. To me, like, I mean, obviously he had to get trapped and then realize he was so trapped that he couldn't get himself out. Yes. Which took probably way too long in itself going back and thinking about it. Uh, but, man, that's, I mean, when it got to 250, bro, I was already like, oh, yeah, he ain't getting Yeah, out he's dead. Yeah, he and again, especially after him being cut off like that. And you're not no. getting, even if you are eating, you're not getting a proper digestion laying like that. No, man. you're not. And, of course, like, Where's his waist going? Where's his muscle? Yeah, yeah. that's what I'm thinking. He's losing. He's deteriorating right there. Where, uh, and honestly, uh, he's poo he's shitting and pissing himself. I forgot. Yeah, time. that too. And, like, and that's days and days and days of that. Again, you're it's exposed foul to down that. There. Yeah. Oh, it probably smells horrible. Yeah. And and that causes like that can cause like. You know, bed sores and gangrene. And See, he didn't even get into that. Oh, boy. He kind of kept it light on that, too. Yeah. Like, I could only imagine how bad it was. How bad it must have been. I, can't, I can't imagine. Bro. That's a mind state I don't want to be in. Me neither. Like, trapped in a hole, no dark. Yeah. And again, <laughs> I appreciate Internet Historian for his storytelling and everything like that. But this was five stars. This I, is, I, uh, four, four point three. Okay, okay. I can't just give five away. No, 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 no. <laughs> you're you're going with the Dave Portnoy you thing. It's like you can't give it a ten. You can't give it a ten. You have to give it something. Four point three though. For no, my first one. Yeah. Yeah. I fuck with this. Like, and it and, was educational. I and there's other lot. stuff that I, I guarantee you. Like, I would love to get your opinion on stuff we've already seen. What we'll do like a Renegades recap? Dude, on where you're so into music Word. and stuff, I think you need to watch the Fire Fest one. That one, oh my oh, god. That, that was a fucking situation. And I think as a musician, you would just be like, you got to be kidding yeah. me. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, like, oh, man. yeah. Man. And also, where you're a gamer, the fall of 76 and the engooding of No Man's Sky. Uh, oh, yeah. That one, those two right there, you know, just like two of the biggest gaming kerfuffles of all time. <laughs> and just getting, like, seeing what all, like, behind the scenes shit was like. And I mean, well, if, you, if you guys don't go back and react to the Costa Concordia, yeah, I recommend you check that one out in your spare time because that, that was a crazy situation. One, like, well, I'll well. we'll definitely be checking out the historian. This was dope. I'm glad y'all put me on to him. Yeah. yeah. So, he got good stuff. His uh, side channel, the Incognito Mode. Is always him talking with a buddy like Samito, the guy that played uh, the him brother. Homer, his brother. Okay, but yeah, 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 like they they just talk about stuff and they are hilarious. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Does he stay with a pretty educational like yes presentation? I well, guess. Well, uh, for his main in, channel, yeah. for his main channel, yes. Incognito mode. It's them fucking around. It's them just being like, to be like, could you imagine what the great pyramids of Giza would look like if they had a if they had a water slide on the side of it? That's good enough. And for he me. like and he like does a Photoshop of a giant water slide on the side of it. He's just <laughs> like, imagine how fast you're going at the end. It's like you get down to the bottom and you basically just go shooting across the sand. You like skid across it. Well, they, they did a great one recently where he literally just gave him uh, si like awkward situations and had him react to what he would do. Yes, and then kept playing the story out for him. He's like, so you're in a massage parlor. And you, you guys just got done massaging, and he's just like, "All right, you're done." And then he just karate chops you right between the cheeks. What do you do? <laughs> he lifts your towel up and then karate chops you between yeah. the cheeks. It's like, what do you do? <laughs> oh, I don't and know. Just like go, and it's like, it's like, okay, I immediately get up and I sum up this guy. What's this guy look like? Big, muscular Swedish man. Obvi looks like Brock Lesnar, but with a ponytail. Kick to the knee. I'm out. 
Yeah, just like <laughs> kick, yeah, just a shit, just a, a yeah, elliptic, <sighs> elliptical kick, an elliptical kick straight to the knee, and you sweet just shin music, bro. Like, he oh. somehow became, <laughs> uh, he somehow got to becoming the king of England in one of the scenarios too. Yes, that one's hilarious. Again, I love internet historian, and uh, yeah. So for the first introduction, as a hell of a first introduction for you, it was man. what I'm a sorry hell of a. That, sorry, it was a little bit. We of had to lose one for that introduction. We yeah, lost a life right, right there. Oh. <laughs> anyway, thank you may all very rest much. Rest in peace, and may nobody dig Yo, up rest his bones again. Floyd, man. Yeah, Floyd. You've Please, been nobody enough, else man. dig that man up. You've been through enough, my man. Just leave. <laughs> Let the man rest. A special place God, in hell please for don't let me else piss you off. <laughs> like what? what yeah, like whatever God, Floyd did, let, yeah. I don't want to do nothing yeah. like that. Give me a sign <laughs> to not be like Floyd. <laughs> it's like maybe that's why God made me fat, so I don't want to have to be. Y'all gotta go splunking. Exactly. Well, hey man, gotta keep him away from that. <laughs> oh God. Anyway, so yeah, man in a cave by Internet Historian. Thank you all very much for tuning in. Check out Internet Historian. Be sure to go over to his channel, check out his videos, leave a like on his videos, leave a like on our video Please. if you want to see more Internet Historian reactions. And also if you want to see Drawn Up do some uh, recaps with me on some of the older Internet Historian videos, no, I think I'm those would be a lot of fun. Yes, sir. And uh, yeah. Well, I don't guess. forget to check out his new channel. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, uh, D's World. It's out now. D's World. Be sure to look for him. You know, it's just uh, D apostrophe S World. World. Yeah. And don't worry, you can't miss it. It's literally him like coming to get you. <laughs> yes, sir. You'll see. You'll see what I mean when you see the th- when you see the channel thumbnail. Whoa. Anyway, thank y'all very much. Until next time, I'm Nate. You're drawn up. I am Nick. I'll see you later, everybody. Peace. Peace.